Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hang on a second. They're wondering, what are we laughing at? Uh, yes, not will. Yeah. Okay, here we are. Good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are listening to us. Uh, g'day, I'm uh, Red Ted Jed. Uh, Ted Jednak. No, it's not a speech impediment. It is actually my name. Now, I'm wondering if I can ask you, can you see this guy here? It's, I, I've had a bit of a history with uh, imaginary friends, you see, and uh, I've got a funny feeling that... Like, he looks really real to me. He's like, are you real? Please explain. Who are you? Well, I just felt your hands on me then. Ooh, so there must be yes. something. And the cat is near my feet. Ooh. So, um, <laughs> so my name is Ben. Uh, I'm a friend of Ted. Okay, uh, just we rewind there. It's, he's a friend of mine, so that's, it's true. That's, that's, I have a, a friend. That, that's just being completely transparent now. <laughs> I'm, I'm revealing all. Um, I'm a physiotherapist. 20 years experience, okay. run a private practice here in Adelaide. One, and, but you've uh, got how many outlets? Three, uh, four. Four. Four, yes. And um, I have a, a, a special interest, if you like, in education, mm -hmm. and particularly around the topics that we're discussing. Yes. This is the guy with the brains here. So uh, I was going to say, I'm the look, you're the you? brains. What does that What am I doing here? Uh, and I've got, I'm neither there. Okay, great. Look, uh, for those of you who don't know me, I help foot fixers take their skills, particularly with manual therapies, to the next level so that you can shortcut your path to the leading edge of your profession. I've been a health practitioner for 30 years, so I've got 10 years on top wow. of you. Um, been training uh, health practitioners in the field of manual therapies for 22 years now. So if you're a physio, a chiro, an osteopath, a podiatrist, remedial therapist, a personal trainer even we have uh, on uh, our books, Welcome, you're in the right place. Thanks for joining us live today on Triple T TV. And this is the special edition, uh, because uh, in this special edition, from Tedjucation, we have Ben, which makes it Bedjucation, the CPD you can take lying down. Love it. Oh, that's, I love it. That's we like fi finally got that right after three weeks. weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe like that. Last week, uh, Ben stirred up uh, a lot of the Facebook uh, FMT community with his insights and evidence uh, on how fear, food, and fitness, no famine in there, hmm. and how they affect your uh, osteo arthritis treatment outcomes. And this was both good and bad uh, that we uh, had there. Hola Manuel, it's good to have you on board, uh, making sure that they're uh, your thumbs that are swinging across there. Uh, if you didn't miss last week, because Manuel, you were there last week uh, with, uh, I think it was with your bacalao, bacalao, uh, uh, enjoying your evening session. Um, if you missed it, you can scroll down and you'll see the link to uh, last week's show. Today, BC and I are going to continue this discussion on the knee so that foot fixers can determine when knee pains are actually coming from the foot and when they don't and how to tell the difference. So um, BC and I thought this was such a crucial topic that we said like, this is going to have a whole show unto itself. So today we're going to give you clear evidence informed understandings so that you can improve your clinical outcomes for your knee patients. But before we go into that, uh, we just had a quick uh, caffeine fix uh, as, as far as our preparation goes here. And uh, Ben needed a coffee and he actually even needed uh, some cognac in the coffee. I think it <laughs> was your request. Because he's just come hot on the heels of a complaint from a GP and hospital about his services. So I'm thinking, holy moly, he must have really done something that uh, warranted the complaint. However, it is clinically relevant to the sorts of things that happen in your clinic. Mm. So, oh, I was going to say, I asked for Ben's permission. I didn't. Mm. I said, no, well, Dr. Already, Lewis said that. You've already gone down <laughs> that path now. So, tell, would oh, you no, mind sharing what I'll, happened? Well, I think, um, without going into detail... No, I think, we want I think, to go detail. I think, what, I think the, the, the crux of it, though, and where it can help health practitioners, is that... Uh, I guess increasingly in this day and age, we're being questioned more and more about what we do, yes. how we do it, yep. what the evidence is behind what we do. And I think we assume probably too often that the people that we're dealing with, and that is obviously patients, mm -hmm. um, but that may also be key stakeholders, referrers, um, de heads of departments and organisations, mm -hmm. are also somewhat aware or conscious of the research behind the way we practice and the way we do things. Yep. So hence when um, complaints come about, 
mm-hmm. which they do from time to time, no matter what health business you run, is yes. my experience. Yep. Um, I think we probably need to sometimes use those as uh, examples of where we can actually educate those people that we work with, the patients, the key stakeholders in various organisations, GPs, referrers, about the evidence out there mm-hmm. to justify um, the way we do things. Yes. So that complaints perhaps then don't arise when quite clearly there's some degree of misunderstanding. So the example you're referring to, which I've yes. dealt with this morning, yes. um, is a, a GP and a patient um, having, I guess, some misinformation about the amount of physiotherapy required post-surgery. Mm-hmm. And uh, the patient getting a sense of, oh, you know, it was routine that I should have physiotherapy once a week after my joint replacement. Yes. Um, and the GP sort of saying, well, no, that's, there's no clinical justification for that and why have they recommended that mm-hmm. and et cetera, et cetera. So my response then had to center around obviously addressing the complaint or the concerns, but more so justifying um, the approach, which wasn't to see someone once a week for three months necessarily, but the approach and why we would take that approach of follow-up and what evidence there is to support that. Yes. Because I think we can certainly justify um, our clinical decisions then on mm-hmm. the best evidence-informed research yes. that is out there. And we can't assume that other people know that. Yes. We might be the ones that, that have to educate people in that space. Yes. Yeah, but get this. When, uh, so the patient told the GP, the GP then complained to the hospital, and then the, was it the hospital that set up the complaint or the GP uh, uh, r- lodged a, a at, formal complaint? At the complaint? moment, I'm still trying to gather information oh, okay, on right. that. But, but yes. Yeah, so but the, you the, weren't contacted. No, the second, the, second, the second issue is that <laughs> cl- clearly, and this, this does happen from mm. time to time, but clearly the people that can do the most about um, fixing the problem, yes. if there is a problem, yep. but the people that can do the most to actually manage the problem for everybody's benefit are usually the last people to find oh, out. No, but yes. And then this is what has happened in this situation. It's gone, it been escalated to a level that it should never have gone to, yes. and we could have easily dealt with it. Yeah, that's no. probably the point. I think there we're dealing with uh, mm. psychosocial uh, behaviours and tendencies there because mm. um, in the uh, 43 complaints that have been raised against me, I think in 42 of them, it's just this year. So, uh, Last week. Like, <laughs> you got the hotline to ARPRA. Anyway, oh, okay. So, um, Ben, thank you very much for sharing that. I know, and it is, it's a thing, uh, as health professionals, we definitely don't like the idea of yeah. getting complaints. But, um, yes, I know that your insights and your experience uh, would be... Uh, invaluable and uh, today we've got just that more of the evidence informed or the evidence behind why we need to look at Mm. the foot and other parts of the body Mm. really there's more to the body than just the foot beyond the foot foot. foot. yes uh, particularly in relation to knee problems Um, so we're going to be chatting about uh, our clinical experiences case scenarios uh, and the sort of uh, situations that you'll find in your clinic so this can be clinically relevant to you Uh, we've got a fabulous show lined up full of uh, uh, valuable references and links to to the key actions Um, and I'm hoping that by the time you see this if you're seeing it live you're going to be struggling but if you're seeing this as a replay uh, I am having uh, and have had a wonderful morning of uh, technical issues uh, with uh, getting the freebie organized. So um, don't worry, once it's done, I will get it sorted out and I'm hoping that that'll happen uh, before my day is up uh, today. Uh, So today is really a a bit for health practitioners who feel they could offer more effective evidence-informed treatment options for their patients suffering knee pains. Look, If you've already got your knee patients totally sorted, then that's fine. Uh, You don't have to worry about the latest evidence-informed treatment options. You can go back and watch, I don't know, know, the latest rerun of Gilligan's Island or something. Um, Hey, were you a fan of Gilligan's Island? You're lucky. You're lucky. I'm in the age group that still does remember <laughs> Gilligan's yes, Island. Yeah, I, I think it's um, going to have a. a, a so yes, yeah, so I, I remember seeing the Gilligan's Island reruns when I was a child. Okay, well, so and, were you um, a ginger or a Marianne guy? Um, oh, it depends on the day. Oh, well, <laughs> now I know your wife. <laughs> you know, so I'm thinking, you go ginger. Well, you, you, you can probably answer it. Yeah, well, yeah, that's a, but yeah, I no. I was going to say I used to change teams as well. Not, not oh. 
No, we're not talking about the professor right now. <laughs> no, I, that's, that's, probably oh, not, that's probably not a good one. <laughs> this is a daytime and a uh, PG rated uh, program. So let's kick on with today's show, which is when do feet need assessing? Get it? Need? K N E E D? Need. Oh, I'm so full of it. I don't remember. <laughs> okay, so first question I have for you is what percentage of knee pain patients have foot pain involvement? Um, well, dare I use an old analogy of the knee bone is connected to the foot bone. Yes. Um, so in terms of the, the actual numbers, well, we, we came across a really good paper not long ago. Um, is it in here? I don't know if it is in there. It might be in there. It probably is in there. Okay. But essentially, um, when they looked at a group yeah, it's of... Yeah, that one um, right there. When they looked at a group of knee arthritis patients... Yes. Um, they found over half of them had associated foot pain um, and in both feet. So a significant proportion of people with knee arthritis yes. also seem to present with foot pain. So in this particular study, they, they found that 25% of those patients had foot involvement ah, yes. and over half of them it was in both feet. So clearly okay. um, in an arth <laughs> knee arthritis population, it probably is a pretty significant problem Yes. Um, that maybe we have or have not identified and therefore addressed. And this is probably a, a very important area where physios and podiatrists could work hand in hand because we're going to be seeing the same patients with the same problems. Same problems. Um, if you are a... Uh, I know most of our audience are um, podiatry-based, uh, well, most... A podiatrist, that was a long sentence, get that out. Um, if you have, like, let us know what percentage of uh, knee patients, or what percentage of your patients would yeah. complain or mention knee troubles as well. We'll see how we can uh, incorporate uh, the two together because... Um, but it, it, it makes sense because if you've got someone with a chronic knee condition, yep. uh, whatever that may be, if let's say it's arthritis, but if they've got a chronic knee condition, now as part of our basic assessment we would be used to assessing things like their gait and balance and those yes. sorts of functional tasks mm -hmm. now obviously those things involve a component of foot and knee assessment and hip yes. and other areas so we're looking at it anyway yes but it would make sense if someone is dealing with a chronic issue mm -hmm. in their knee that over a period of time aspects of the way they move and the way they do things would also change that would also influence other areas yes so it's probably not surprising really yeah um but maybe do we do we ask about it enough do we say to those patients do you have pain mm. in other areas pain in your foot pain mm. in your hip pain in your lower back associated with your knee complaint so how would they know whether it's associated how would we as a practitioner or a clinician know um, whether something is associated yeah. with so I would say as a clinician, that's where your clinical reasoning comes uh, into it. So if you are asking subjectively about yeah. the nature of their pain, mm -hmm. whether it's foot and knee or one or the other, there'll be a couple of simple questions. So let's take the onset of it. Someone might say, oh, look, I started to get my knee pain six months ago, for example. Right. Um, your follow-up questions should perhaps then reveal if they are also complaining of foot pain, should probably probe and say, well, at what stage did you start to develop foot pain? And if you can determine that there's an association between the onset of their knee problem and then sometime later the onset of their foot problem, yes. then you can be thinking or reasoning that perhaps there's an association there, Okay. if that so, makes sense. That's, a, that's, a, that's looking at history. Yes. If you look at behaviour, though, so if you're looking at behavioural questions related to their knee problem, um, people might say things like, Look, when I walk 100 metres, I get my knee pain. Yes. And your question might be, well, what happens to your foot pain? Do you mm -hmm. also get your foot pain after you walk 100 metres? Or if they go up and down a set of stairs, they might say, well, that produces my knee pain. Yes. What does that do to your foot? Yes. So, so your, your behavioural questions related to the aggravating and easing factors for their complaint, in this case the knee, should also perhaps then be followed through to inquire about the foot. Mm -hmm. and, and by doing that, you're able to start to build some sort of, uh, or build an indication of whether there is a direct relationship there, mm -hmm. if one relates to the other. Okay, uh, so relationship, as far as symptoms yep. coming on, 
can we extrapolate a causal relationship? Like, can, can we say one's causing the other or from a the timing or an activity perspective? Well, I think you can, based on um, what we've just discussed there with the questioning. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, we know there is the, the, the obvious direct effect of, of pain from the knee being referred to the foot. Uh, I mean, I think that's been well documented. Yep. So a knee problem can present with foot pain. Uh, a hip problem can present, present with knee pain. You're like referred pain. So, so we're talking yes. at, a, at a pure um, you know, biomedical level. Yep. We know that the referred pain phenomenon means that if someone presents with foot pain, one of your sources, one of your initial sources should be the knee, okay. for example. Should or, be, or, it should, or it should be the lumbar spine as a potential source of the problem okay. until you have investigated further. Uh -huh. so, so, that, so that's at an absolute level. But at a, at a, um, a behavioural level, then as I said, if you've got somebody that you're dealing with that has got chronic long-term knee dysfunction mm -hmm. through arthritis or, or another condition, then clearly that is going to have an impact somewhere else if that person is moving differently, standing differently, balancing differently, changing the way they do things. And in fact, one of the other studies we looked at is what percentage of um, patients with knee arthritis have also got arthritis in other joints. And it's been reported that up to 80% of, pe of people with hip and knee arthritis also have arthritis on the contralateral side. So, so the, okay. the, the, in, the, the what, what's being indicated there is that they're obviously changing the way they move because they've got an arthritic knee. Mm -hmm. So they're loading up other structures, which are then subsequently going to develop symptoms potentially, mm -hmm. which may not be related to the original problem, but that yes. might have become the major problem down the track. Mm. So in relation to the foot, I'd say you've got your direct biomedical link where someone presents with a foot problem You've got to be thinking, well, what are the other sources other than the foot? Yes. What can refer into this area? Lumbar spine, hip, knee, etc. Yep. And then you've got your, uh, what I would call, from a clinical reasoning point of view, your, your behavioural questions where you're trying to link the aggravating factors for their knee problem to potentially some aggravating factors that also affect their foot. Mm -hmm. And you're able to then build a bit more of a relationship between one problem uh, against the other. Yes. If you ever have had the challenge of um, knowing what research or the filtering through the research, give us a thumbs up or a like or a, a, a comment down here because one of the things that we can draw on with uh, Bren's, ben, Bren's brain, Bren, Bren. <laughs> <laughs> Ben's brain, with the, the BC cerebellum uh, and uh, cranium, I guess is uh, more the thing I'm referring to, is his ability to uh, find out what the good stuff is. And I know as a clinician, as clinicians, this is one of our big challenges is where do we get the time? We spend most of our time treating or working with people. It's such a difficult thing. And part of the mission of education is to kind of filter through and distill the, 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 the essentials down. So you shortcut your path to finding the, the most relevant stuff. So that's, uh, and that, that's, um, we haven't really talked uh, much about your wife other than in the Mary Ann context, but she's also... Ginger. Uh, ginger. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep myself tidy here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, um, of course, her university uh, experience and background as well. They say it's, mm. it's more, you know, like with most blokes, it's usually uh, the, the partner, the woman uh, that's actually got the brains uh, going on here. Than to, that's absolutely the, the case. <laughs> <laughs> We, we acknowledge that. Sorry, look, I thought if I cut you off, you no, were no, going to say something else. Okay. Oh, no, look, I was just going to go further with the, the, talking about the behavioural stuff. Uh, you, we, we probably are used to perhaps asking about things that hurt, you know, yes. things that, that hurt, aggravate, whatever it is. Um, but sometimes the, the powerful information can come in what helps as well or what eases. So if we take the, the foot pain, knee pain example, mm -hmm. and let's pick a simple functional task that a lot of people complain about. They might say, Ted, you know, when I walk a kilometre, I get my foot pain. Yes. Um, or I, I get my foot and my knee pain. Mm -hmm. Or perhaps then start asking some questions that relate to what might help that to see what it does to those different symptoms. So for example, so just, you yeah, might yeah. say, well, what happens when you wear different pairs of shoes, for example? Mm -hmm. What does that do to your foot pain? Oh, yeah, you know, when I wear my sneakers, it's a lot better. Uh -huh. okay. okay. So that might be talking about their foot. But the question I will also then follow through with is, does that have an impact on your knee? Yes. Is your knee better as well? Or, or maybe not? Mm -hmm. So 
so again, the, the emphasis is in asking questions, and I'm a great believer in, um, and we teach a lot of our physio staff this, that if you've screened the patient really well in that subjective examination with area of pain and all those other things, but in particular with the behavioural questions that relate to aggravating and easing, mm -hmm. you're able to glean a lot more information very early in the piece that makes your assessment a lot clearer mm -hmm. and then obviously makes your treatment and your planning a lot clearer. And this is one good example. We were talking about foot pain and knee pain occurring concurrently. Yes. Where is the problem coming from? Yeah. Where is the source of the problem? What are the contributing factors? And you can find a lot of that information by asking the right sort of aggravating and easing questions. Ah, okay, good. There we have it. Uh, oh, and uh, if anyone heard the right answer coming from BC there, it was Mark. So Mark, great to have you uh, on board yet again. Um, we had, a, I thought, a fascinatingly interesting conversation uh, on our Friday morning <coughs> cafe catch-up yes. uh, last week. No, we, we do actually work and we prepare what we're going to uh, uh, deliver on uh, Triple T. And that was, uh, you summed up in the uh, path of least resistance. Uh, Sarah Sarman, is it? Shirley Sarman. Shirley, Shirley Sarman. Shirley, so Shirley, don't, please don't call me Shirley. Shirley Sarman is a very well-known um, physiotherapist in the States, and she's pioneered a lot of the um, concepts, I guess, by which a manual therapist uh, work by, mm -hmm. one of them being um, this concept of the path of least resistance that the body takes, and the, the way we assess and manage patients, um, quite often that's what we're looking for when we're doing our assessment, is where, where are they moving, yes. where are they not moving, yes. and why are they moving that way? And therefore, where, we, where do we need to intervene? So a good example, and we'll talk about the foot in a minute and the knee, but a good example is in the spine. So you might look at someone's spinal movement and notice that there are segments of their spine where they're moving mm -hmm. and segments of their spine where they're not moving because they're stiff or it's, they have an old injury or what have you. Why are you looking at me like so that? So I wonder why. <laughs> so, the, so the concept is this path of least resistance is if you ask someone to do something, bend over to touch your toes, yes. what are they going to do? Well, they're going to move where they can move. Yes. And where they can't move, they're not going to move. So they're mm -hmm. going to find the path of least resistance, the the the, the easiest way for them to achieve that task whether it's normal movement or not doesn't matter so is this like um, you're looking for the sites of compensation or pretty much or it's, it's so in the lower okay. limb the, the concept is are the problems we're dealing with in the lower limb if we're taking a foot problem or a knee problem is it coming from the top down mm -hmm. or the bottom up yes where is the issue and we know there's a lot of research that relates to proximal factors being involved with lower limb problems so so hip, lumbar spine, pelvis problems being related to knee problems, foot and ankle problems. Yes. But the question I asked you, which, which I was interested in as a physiotherapist, but what about the other way around? What about the bottom up? Mm -hmm. What about foot types, foot postures, foot mechanics affecting things proximally? Yes. So Shirley Salmon in the lower limb anyway talks about the concepts of, you know, if you have weak hip uh, external rotators mm -hmm. and you get someone to do a task like a hop, jump, single leg squat. Clearly with weak hip external rotators, the hip's gonna internally rotate when they squat. Mm -hmm. That's gonna create a knee valgus moment. That's gonna create a pronatory stress on the foot. Yes. So obviously top down. But equally, if someone has a rigid or supinated foot and you're asking them to do a task like hop, then clearly with a rigid supinated foot, if they're not gonna get any shock absorption when they do that, yes. all the forces are gonna be directed up the closed kinetic chain putting stress on their knee and hip and lumbar spine. Okay. So um, I guess that's, that's where she sort of then talks about, well, what does the body do? Well, the body moves and, and adjusts where it can. So in that first example, there's a lot of give around the hip, so it collapses at the hip. Okay. That's just the easiest way to move. Mm -hmm. In the second example, the foot's rigid, so the foot can't give, so they've got to give higher up, right. if that makes sense. Yes. So um, I guess when we're then assessing patients, it's probably what we're looking for is where, mm -hmm. where is the path of least resistance for that patient and therefore where do I need to actually start my treatment? Okay, so let us, um, can we use a, a classic uh, or a, a common or typical uh, example? Um, I, I guess um, 
Manuel, this is a, an example that's uh, typical of the region, uh, and that would be uh, in relation to, say, plantar heel pain, and we've got a foot that is um, more mobile, or you know, the collapsing mm. pes pancreas uh, almost uh, yep. foot structure. And we've got this associated <coughs> knee trouble. How would you go about? What are the key clinical tests that you would go through mm. uh, to determine is it the foot that's contributing to the yep. knee, or is the knee contributing to the foot? Well, as we know, there's a million different clinical tests for every area of the body. Yes. Um, there's a whole bunch of ankle and foot tests, there's a whole bunch of knee tests. Uh, we know from other areas of the body, particularly the shoulder, that when they go to try and validate a lot of these tests for reliability and sensitivity and specificity, they perform quite poorly. Uh -huh. um, so we can, we can use a lot of those tests, but we have to use them with caution because they may not always be telling us what we think they're telling us. So the, the easiest way... Um, that I would start the process yes. would be through what we term as physios and our training is based on the concept of differentiation, which basically means if we're talking about a lower limb problem, we would be looking to choose an activity that hurts that person, okay. that reproduces their pain. Let's say it was single leg squat produced knee pain. Mm -hmm. and But our decision or, or our thinking was that Okay, we know when they squat they get their knee pain, mm -hmm. but how do we know what component the foot might be contributing to that knee pain? Yeah. How do we know what component the hip might be contributing? We can, we can take them away and assess their hip and assess their foot yes. and make some assumptions about that. Mm -hmm. But one of the easiest and quickest ways to get a bit of an idea is to do some differentiation. So change Easiest and quickest, I like the sounds of that. So, Come on, no what? Oh, can we get you to stand a up? A demo. So, um, <clears throat> I don't know if everyone can see this, but let's say you had left knee pain. Okay. And one of the things you said to me is, oh, Ben, when I, when I squat on that knee, I get my pain. Yes. And I look at you and I go, yeah, look, uh, you know, his feet don't look quite right, or there's a bit of an issue with his pelvis or his hips. I've seen him walk. I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure what's going on there. Mm -hmm. And so I might get you to do something very simple where I'll say, Ted, can you stand on your left leg? I'll give you some support so you can hold on to something. Okay. First of all, we want to know, do you have any pain there at rest? No. Right now. No. So can you stand on your left leg for me? And I want you to squat down, just let me know what you're feeling. Okay, I get it up there and I feel like so, in the kneecap. And, and how strong is that pain out of 10? 4.6. Yeah, so he's very specific about his uh, quantity. So, so what I want to know is, is that reproducing his pain and at what level? Okay. Then I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, I'm going to assume it's coming from his knee, but I'm interested if I change a couple of components around the knee, whether it changes it. So one thing I might start with, if we're thinking of the um, top down, bottom up, Yes. one of the things I might do is adjust his foot position and say, okay, Ted, what I'm going to do here is just change your foot posture a little bit. And in this case, I'm just increasing his arch to give him a little bit more of a sense of a bit more of a stable base. Yes. I want you to squat down again, Ted, and tell me what happens there. Oh, is it still 4.6? No, no, it actually feels easier on my okay. can't feel it. Okay. Yep. So I don't know much else yet about the what's going on in terms of the source, but I do know changing his foot mm -hmm. changes his pain. So that gives me a bit of a clue early in the piece that his foot might have to be part of the treatment plan okay. or the process to help manage his knee. Because I can change that component and it changes his pain. Yes. Okay? Yep. Then I might, we might do something similar. So let's say, for example, when I got him to squat initially, I saw that his, he stood on his left leg, his pelvis dropped on the right side. Uh -huh. okay. okay. And I thought, mm, okay, that to me would give me an indication before I assess his hip that there's some sort of hip dysfunction, weakness around his hip muscles. Okay. So, what so I, just before you go with that, yeah. hip drop. Like how much is that? How visible is it? Are you talking centimeters, or is no, it you know one centimeter? How how no, no, I think precise do we need to be? It's more of an observation, but but you should be looking for consistent patterns. Okay. So when we talk about hip weakness and we talk about gait, the two most common patterns that we see is a Trendelenburg yep. gait. So that's where the pelvis drops. I think clinically we actually don't see that that often. Everyone talks about that, yes. but we don't see it that often. What we do see much more often is a gluteus medius gait. 
or what is called a gluteus medius gait. So okay. instead of when you stand and when you stand on your left leg, instead of your pelvis dropping on the right, yes. what most people do is they actually hitch their trunk across towards the standing limb, which reduces the load on their, in this case, your left glute medius, so it doesn't have to work so hard. Oh, and what, okay. what this does is it lifts your pelvis up on the right hand side. More people clinically, I think, do that than right. actually physically drop their pelvis on the other side. Yes. Because if you think about it, if they did that, they'd catch their foot every time they went to walk. I suppose, yes. So in order to not do that, we see this much more. So, so does that mean that gait is people are doing, or is it a unilateral? It, it can be unilateral. We mm -hmm. do see people where it's bilateral. Yes. We, you see those people that waddle? Yes. Okay. okay. Well, they've got a bilateral glute med gait pattern. Yep. Guess what they come in with to see us for? Okay. Uh, low back? Back pain. Yeah, back, back pain. pain. Okay. And again, yes. it's logical. If you mm -hmm. think about it, if they're doing this constantly when they walk, yes. constant side bending is not a normal movement for your lower back. Okay. And yes. you're bending over to pick something up. But if yes. they're doing that constantly every step they take, yep. they're going to come in with back pain. Is that the problem though? Well, uh, we treat their back and we'll yes. get their back better. But is that the problem? No, it would be the glute meds if uh, that's the cause. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, right. That's the problem. Unless we address mm. that, yes. we'll send them away with relief of their back pain. But yes. they'll be back in a week or three months or six months with their back pain again. Yeah, right. But back to the foot. Okay, what's um, the foot? Yes. So, so in terms of how we're observing that, it, it's more of a clinical judgment of whether you think they've got a pelvic drop or a rotation of the pelvis or they're hitching their trunk. You'll see that very obviously with their just assessing their gait. Okay. Forget about going to a specific test like this. But in this example, I get you to stand on that left leg again. What I might do if I see your pelvis drop is I might actually manually try and correct that okay. and get you to squat again and say, Ted, tell me what your pain is there. Is it still a 4.6 out of 10? Yeah, yeah, it still okay. is. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm not making any conclusions yet. Yeah. All that's telling me is I know your knee hurts when you squat. Yes. I know if I change your foot position, I can change that pain. I know if I change your hip position, I can't change that pain. Okay. That doesn't mean the hip might not be involved, but what it yes. means maybe for that first assessment or that first treatment is I'm going to look at your knee, of course, yes. but I'm probably going to do something about your foot as well because mm -hmm. I know that's having a positive influence on your knee. Okay. Does that make sense? Very much so. And while we're talking about foot, let us uh, get into a little more detail with the foot. What would you do with the foot? How would you determine whether so, <coughs> feet are... A, Positive factor. So as a physio, I mean, we are obviously educated to assess and treat feet um, from a manual therapy perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I would say, and this is not just because you're a friend of mine, but, but probably not to the depth that you have gone into with your FMT training and assessment sure. and, and what have you, but yes. physios are trained to deal with assessment and treatment of the feet from a manual therapy perspective. Probably very much on the, the biomedical model though, and, um, what does that mean when you say Well, that? I guess we're dealing with structure and biomechanics and function. And yes. um, I think from a treatment point of view, we would implement techniques like taping, mm -hmm. uh, muscle retraining, um, foot mobilisation, but again, in a, a much more of a, a biomedical approach. You know, we find a restricted segment, stiff segment, we would mobilise that. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the most important things, which we, I know we've discussed a lot, is that to, to assess the effect of that um, by reassessing the, the functional activity that you're testing or what have you to see if we're making a change. Okay, so what's a, an example with that? If I'm getting my foot pain yep. when I go for my morning jog. So, let, let, so let's take that example there that we just did. Yes. One of my treatments on the first day may be actually to do nothing to your knee but send you away with your foot taped yes. and some stretches on your calf if I found that there was restriction there and to send you away and say, Ted, provided the problem wasn't severe and irritable from a pain point of view, mm -hmm. send you away and, and get you to do exactly the same week that you would normally do, but with just that intervention. Okay, and, so see, and see how you... much that changed it. One of the, um, I think it's not really a problem, but one of the things that perhaps physios get used to doing, and maybe podiatrists as well, is we provide multimodal treatment. We do lots of things to a patient. Oh, yes. Lots of things for one condition. and, and that's probably because clinically and with experience, we've worked out that when we provide treatment as a package, it works better than one thing alone. Okay. One of the problems with that is it's sometimes hard to differentiate 
what has been the most effective intervention. Yes. And sometimes we've all heard the term less is best. Yes. And sometimes where that come that is what where that comes into it, that mm-hmm. sometimes maybe you don't have to intervene as much as you think to make a significant change. Mm-hmm. That a small intervention, if it's targeted and if it's specific and if it's focused, might make a big change rather than doing lots and lots of treatment and then not being sure what's actually made the, the difference. Okay. If you have had uh, the experience of uh, doing a multi-modal uh, treatment service and then patients get better, let us know. Give us a, a thumbs up or a, uh, a comment if you've got a favourite uh, treatment intervention or actually you know, I suppose we're talking about assessment intervention rather yeah. than a treatment yeah. intervention. Yeah. But if you're going, if say um, instead of going multimodal, we've got you know one, two. Uh, let's say uh, we've done the foot taping. I come back what in a week or when would I come back to review? Well, that's that? where well that's where your treatment planning governs it. So again, th- that is based on how acute the condition is, yes. the severity of the pain, mm-hmm. the individual patient's goals. Like you might say to me, look, I want to run the city to bay, yep. our local running event mm-hmm. in a week's time. Yes. Well, clearly you're going to get that person back probably, if not the next day, certainly the day after. Okay. So yeah. that so that will govern a little bit of when you decide. But but in general, in this presentation, the one we've discussed, it will probably be a week. In a week. Because okay. you want to give the intervention a chance to do something. Yes. And give them a chance to... One of the things that patients commonly come back with after the first visit is they remember all the answers they wanted to give you that first time. <laughs> so yes. it's, it's almost to give them a bit of a week to go... Oh, now, yeah, the physio asked me this and that. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you know, I did hurt it then. And, I, and so sometimes yes. that's important. It yes. gives them a bit of a time to go, oh, now, I've got to fill you in on all the stuff you asked me last time. <laughs> yeah. So in this case, yes, a week. Yeah, I okay. Say. So if we come back in a week uh, and let's say I find that uh, the taping didn't make uh, mm-hmm. any noticeable difference. Yep. What would you then do as a, another intervention or another assessment test? Well, we have to be careful here, TJ, that in that scenario, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Because if we oh. go back to that example, yes. what did I do to you in my assessment? I changed your foot posture and it changed your knee pain. Yes. So I still have to think that if I was to reassess that and the same thing happened, I would have to be thinking... The foot is still involved here somehow. Mm -hmm. Maybe my taping wasn't effective because I didn't tape it the right way or it wasn't tight enough or whatever. Yes. But I shouldn't automatically, from a clinical reasoning point of view, think the tape didn't work, it's not the foot. Okay. It's not that black and white. But what I would then do is I would reassess Mm -hmm. that same functional test. If the change in the foot position still affected the knee, I still may intervene with the foot. It may be that... I might tape it slightly differently, mm-hmm. but then depending on what else I've found in terms of foot, uh, in terms of knee or hip, I may incorporate another intervention. Okay. And that will be dependent on what I find. So oh. it may, let's say, for example, it might be um, some activation exercises for your knee muscles or stretching or what have you. Okay. Um, but I'd be very cautious not to jump from one thing to the other. Okay. Yep. No, if that's, that makes that's sense. a good point. It does indeed. Um, how confident can we be where we're doing an artificial knee flexion test with foot posture being uh, mm. altered mm. that um, I go and do my regular activity? Yep. Like there's a big difference between the yep. dynamic, this is what I do on a weekly basis versus what Absolutely. happens in a, in a Absolutely. clinic. It's a really good question. And the answer is, I think there are lots of ways that you can try to replicate that. Mm-hmm. But, but yes, an artificial test in a clinic setting in an, in an isolated um, testing mode, yeah. it doesn't necessarily extrapolate. But if you think about it, what you're trying to do, in, again, in this scenario, is you're trying to reproduce the thing that the person has come to you with. Okay. They've come to you with a knee problem. Yes. They've said my knee hurts. Mm-hmm. So, so as a physiotherapist, um, my first job is, if I can reproduce their pain, that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's a good thing. Because yes. then that can help you get to the source. Yes. Even more powerfully, though, if you can change it within that treatment session or within mm-hmm. that assessment, you've automatically probably got buy-in from that patient because you've been able to do something to change their pain. Okay. And then in terms of extrapolating that to, let's say, their running or what have you, there are still ways that you can achieve that by what we would call sensitising the patient. So you might say to them, 
you know, what I want you to do before the next appointment, if you can, if we can time it right, I want you to go out and run 5Ks. Because mm -hmm. you've told me when you run 5Ks, you get a sore knee. Yes. Come and see me after you've done that. So uh -huh. I can then assess you yep. when you've loaded your knee up. Mm -hmm. And I might pick up some more information about what's going on. Mm -hmm. So there you're looking for things like the influence of fatigue and those sorts of factors okay. that you can't necessarily test easily in the clinic, no, yes. unless you've got them on the treadmill for five, five, five Ks. Yes, all right. Um, what about if uh, your intervention made things worse? Again, very good point. I would actually see that as a positive. So one of the common clinical reasoning mistakes that I see with the younger physio group that we deal with, yes. is when they make somebody worse, their symptoms worse, they tend to panic, they tend to try something different. But I actually say, if you've actually made them better or worse, you've actually got to the source of the problem. Mm -hmm. Because you've made them worse, it may mean that you've maybe over-treated them, yes. or you've treated them too aggressively or too strongly, but you've actually got to the source of the problem, mm -hmm. or you've underestimated the irritability of the condition. Yes. So, so if you've made them worse, it, it would probably lead me to still go down that same course of treatment, mm -hmm. but you may have to modify well, or tailor okay. the treatment. So if we take the taping of the foot example, yes. you may have taped them in such a way that you've overcorrected their arch position. I'll use that as a broad example. Sure, yep. So if I've made them worse, I still may retake them because I know that changing their foot posture still changes their knee pain. Yes. But I may take them in a slightly different way where I don't correct them so much. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that subtlety might be the difference. What if you made no difference to the knee but you caused a problem on the opposite ankle? Like if the whole new made... symptom came uh, in. Or maybe. Well, again, it, dep it depends how you interpret that. What have you done? Is the question yes so you've changed something on one side and you've affected the other side yes so have you made them by changing something on one side have you made them deliberately offload that side and put more load on the other side mm -hmm. once again the way I would interpret that is you've actually probably changed something that in the long run if you adjust the right way might actually be the thing that gives them the benefit I wouldn't. Okay. I guess I wouldn't always look at it as a negative. Yes. And yep. and I think the critical word here is change. You've changed something. Yes. Yes. I Good would point. be much less confident if I do a whole bunch of tests, I try a whole bunch of treatments, and it does nothing. It makes no change. Yes. I go, gee, I'm not having much success here with this person, but if I can change it, obviously for the better. Clearly, we're trying to relieve their symptoms. That yes. would be the ultimate. But if I change it, mm. even if in, on occasions it's worse, yep. the important thing about that is you must advise the patient that that's a possibility and that that could be normal. So this is where, so, this is where the interpretation can be uh, problematic with a complaint, going back to complaints. <laughs> yes. It's really important that we need to tell patients that when we are implementing our treatment, whatever that is, yes. that ultimately these are, these are the reasons we're doing it, these are the benefits, these are the risks, mm -hmm. one of the risks is that we might make it worse. That may not be a bad thing for exactly the reasons that I've explained. And mm -hmm. if you explain that to the patient, they kind of get it too. Yes. Like a lot of patients say to us, oh, I really want you to press on that because that's where it hurts. And, <laughs> and that hurts, but it feels good. It's a good hurt. It's like you're yes, doing something. I know that feeling. So, so if, if, I think if you explain that to people and say, look, I've done all this work on your foot, Ted, mm -hmm. and this, this is why I'm doing it, don't worry if you're a bit sore for the first 24 to 48 hours. Yes. That's pretty normal. That's yep. treatment soreness. Mm -hmm. And that's actually a good indication we've got to the source of the problem. Uh -huh. I think if you explain that, if they come back worse, then they're less worried. Yes. And they're more likely to come back because yes. you've actually already explained that. Yeah, yes. That, that patient education uh, is such a critical thing, which I... Education too. <laughs> <laughs> Beat me to it. <laughs> Vegetation. Um, I'm not taking that line down. So, have we got off the track there? We have indeed. Yeah. Now, uh, I'm uh, also very mindful uh, of. We've had this is a, a great dissertation and exploration of, uh, I guess, one clinical scenario. I know. Uh, that we've got uh, some training coming up because what I'm particularly looking forward to is 
part of my reason for lassoing uh, Ben into uh, Triple T is to help with podiatrists, particularly trying to work out how they can uh, manage their patients who are experiencing knee, hip and uh, postural spinal type of problems as well. I don't know if you're in a position yet to, to my next, so my question here is where can podiatrists learn this stuff? Because like you said, there's a plethora of stuff if you go to YouTube or um, Google Scholar, it's like how do I work out what is the clinically relevant uh, and also it's going to be most uh, specifically uh, helpful for me and the patients I see in my clinic. Where am I going to get um, the, the good well, stuff? Well look, I think one of the reasons that we have come together is that we've recognised that there's a lot of education out there mm -hmm. in the marketplace for allied health practitioners yeah. but probably a lot of it is quite segmented in terms of you know the specific education for physios here or chiropractors over here or podiatrists over here yes uh, probably what we should be doing is maybe cross-pollinating a bit more okay. and providing yeah. education that encompasses all the things that we see every day yes these patients that we're talking about and the examples that we're talking about are presenting to podiatrists and physios. We're seeing the same people. Yes. So from an education point of view, we probably should be educating each other mm -hmm. so that we are better informed as to the simple, the simple thing is when to refer, mm -hmm. um, but also able to identify things that we maybe have missed in the past that could have made a big difference to the treatment <laughs> yes. that we were doing. Yes. Okay. Yeah, no, that, so, that's so well put. Uh, and so I think... Yeah. Uh, mm. Traditionally, we've probably gone, oh, yep, yeah, this patient, I'm talking from a physio perspective now, yes. we've seen this patient with a terrible foot type. Um, we go, oh, I think you need to see a podiatrist. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe we haven't explored all the elements of that presentation and vice versa for a podiatrist mm. has maybe not looked at, okay, maybe there's some other stuff going on here. And I know if I treat that person with my podiatry intervention, but I also get them to see my physio yes. at the same time, together, we're gonna to get a better result. Yes. Um, we don't have the time to go through this uh, today, but uh, uh, also in last Friday's cafe catch up, uh, ben went through and tested my VMO and compared to my lateral hip uh, stabilizing muscles. And it was really simple, but very effective, that literally you can do in a cafe. So, you can know, you, can you do it now, after a week? <laughs> yes, well, I was putting my fingers, it was okay, I put my fingers where it was uh, legally uh, able to do. Uh, but these are the sort of tests uh, that I'm really looking forward to learning. Uh, Ben's running a workshop on uh, a day at the knee next, uh, that's in March 24th. Uh, so, and this is specifically for uh, those practitioners uh, who are not so well educated, like podiatrists, uh, in relation to the upper uh, kinetic chain. Mm -hmm. So that's, um, we'll, uh, in our uh, freebie that we have uh, here today, uh, that hopefully is going to be ready uh, in the next uh, hour or so with all the references uh, to the um, links, uh, or the references that uh, Ben has covered, as well as uh, if you're interested in uh, the workshop as far as learning about what are the clinical tests and how better to help your patients who are having knee troubles that might be coming from the hip or might be coming from the foot, uh, that's uh, going to be happening. Uh, it's, uh, what do we say? It's a remarkable resource that's a gift to you from bed education because getting your bed education in bed has to be the ultimate way to get ahead. <laughs> Is that a tissue? I mean, a tissue, a t shirt, a bumper sticker? We no should comment. <laughs> get ahead in bed. Oh, geez. No, I'm, move on, Ted. Yes. <laughs> get my foot out of it right now. Uh, you'll get uh, so the freebie will have all those links. If you've just joined us, um, I'm Red Ted Jed, and this is my mate. He's a physio, BC. He's the good looking one of uh, the duo here. Uh, we've chewed the fat on knee pains, especially in relation to foot function and how the two uh, interact or are correlated. We've covered uh, what are the biomechanical uh, factors, we've talked about muscle physiology, we've talked about treatment research. It's been a total cracker of a show. Uh, really looking forward to uh, the workshop that uh, you're going to be running next year. Uh, the uh, I know we've uh, talked specifically about the aged knee and uh, the sporting knee. Now, and every time he talks about the aged knee, he looks at me with his look in his eye. What do you mean by an aged knee or an old knee? How, how is that defined? 
Well, I guess you're talking about uh, a knee that's maybe long-suffering or, or maybe looks long-suffering. And We've had mm -hmm. previous discussions in previous shows about radiology yes. and the way joints look on investigations and how they function. So um, I don't know that there is such a term because when we start to talk about the sporting knee, yes. the sporting knee eventually moulds into the age, aged knee yes. um, in frighteningly a fairly short period of time. Yes, now this was, um, uh, I guess, what I was leading towards when mm. um, you talked about someone had an ACL um, yeah. surgical procedure, say, at 26 years of age. Yeah. What so, happens post-surgery? Well, so I think some of the most recent evidence, and this was from a recent conference I attended in Sydney, um, talked about um, the... the, the the incidence of total knee replacement after having an ACL reconstruction and and the, lo the length of time and and I, I can't recall the exact numbers offhand but there's a there's a certainly an increased incidence within 15 years after having an ACL reconstruction of a likelihood of needing a total knee replacement. Whoa. Um, and and more disturbingly, when you talked about the arthritis component, I think it was um, they looked at a group of sporting knee injuries and the average age of a sporting knee injury is in your 20s yes um, and when they tracked them over time they found that um, again within a very short period of time i'm going to say under 15 years there was a very high incidence of them developing knee arthritis so this is like, uh, um, and so these are potentially people we're talking about in their mid to late 30s yes um, that are ending up with significant arthritic changes and therefore mm -hmm. looking at other options in terms of how to manage. And traditionally that's always been way too young to have a knee replacement. Yes. Yeah. So when we talk about the aged knee, I mean, are we saying 35 and 40 is aged? Mm -hmm. uh, I hope not. Because you, yes, you and I are both in trouble. <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, some of that data mm. is quite frightening. Mm -hmm. And so hence a lot of work has been done looking at um, uh, preventative programs yes. for ACL injury and that's something that we'll touch on in the course um, and a lot of those focus on would you believe the simple things of teaching people how to jump and land correctly young sports people how they can jump and land correctly, correctly. And teaching them technique yes. about those sorts of things to help reduce the incidence of ACL injuries reduce the incidence of reconstructions and therefore reduce the incidence of early arthritis and early knee replacements. Mm. This is, uh, I think... Um, so they're all linked, I guess. Yes, uh, Professor David Hunter, he mm. referred to the the value of actually that retraining at a young age, yeah. where, of course, uh, there aren't the resources uh, spent like they are on uh, elite athletes and yeah. professional and, athletes. And the, the interesting thing about that is he, he also put a... I guess a financial cost to that as well. Yeah. But, but actually, if more of the money was invested in those programs, the, the reduction in cost at the other end is significant in terms of yes. the health costs for um, having joint replacements, etc. You know, down the track. Uh -huh. so. Yes, uh, that that is a, a, a great uh, podcast to get hold of. Which is also, was that last week's? Uh, Show, uh, yes, it was. It was, yes. So we had the link to it. So um, that, if nothing else, uh, is what you ought to do to uh, have a listen if you're interested in arthritic wear and tear and what the best options are, as what the latest evidence is, and the best options for management, which typically uh, looking to avoid surgery. Uh, that, that's a big thing. All right, uh, so before we sign off for today, uh, this just letting you know, this is the last Triple T TV show for this year. The question been is, a few, hasn't yes, <laughs> there's been a few. Question to you, dear viewer, is do you want us back? Uh, if so, please let us know. Uh, pop us a, um, a comment in the comment box whether you want to, uh, if this has been a useful thing for you. Should I hope you say it has been, but if it hasn't, you better let us know. Then, uh, on a day like today, we couldn't lay out in the sun and uh, have some uh, refreshing. But we would love to uh, be back. Would you be willing to be come back, Ben? If we oh, uh... for the right price, too. But <laughs> no, of course, of course, very happy to be involved uh, in the future. Great, wonderful. So, um, if we did continue into uh, next year, and given uh, your experience, what are the sort of things that you would? be willing to contribute to our FMT family out there? Well, I think um, what these last few weeks have done 
is probably just bring a, I guess, a physiotherapy perspective to some of the common things that you all deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Yep. Probably uh, a little bit of education about the way we deal with these problems. Mm -hmm. um, but then more broadly, just talk about the, the way we assess, the way we reason through these processes, some of the treatment options we provide. Um, and I guess from my point of view, and my interest is looking at you know what evidence is out there yes. and distilling it in a way that people can actually use and take to the clinic yep. and educate their patients with. So that example that we were using earlier about a complaint and having to educate people, I think, and I had this discussion with one of my younger physios this morning and, and said, you know, when you're, when you're going through a treatment plan with somebody, tell them what the evidence is. Mm -hmm. They don't know what they don't know. Yeah, but if you yes. base some of your advice and your recommendations of what you're telling them to do, whether it's how many times they need to come back or how long they need to do this program for, hang your hat on some evidence because it's probably there Yes. And that builds some credibility that, that you're obviously keeping up to date with it, but also what you're telling them is not just your opinion. Yes. Um, yep. It is actually based on something that you have read, studied, looked at, and is out there in the world mm. um, yes. that you don't necessarily know. And as we've already discussed, your key stakeholders may not know that. Yes. So I think it's important. So, so that's mm. what I can bring because that is my interest. Yes, and certainly that distillation is uh, something that I definitely enjoy. If, it, if there's a way that I can get to the, the key mm. quality stuff, mm. then uh, that would yeah. be worthwhile. So very, very exciting. Well, um, Ben, I want to say thank you very much for bringing your wealth of uh, experience and knowledge to the FMT family. Um, anything you would like to say before Oh, I'd just like to wish uh, yourself and Dr. Lil and all of the viewers Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Yes. It is already the 12th of uh, December. So, <gasps> 12 days yeah, to go. It's a bit frightening. I better go and do some shopping. <laughs> um, but yeah, Merry Christmas and best wishes to all for the New Year. Uh, wonderful. Thank you very much. So uh, if you want us uh, to return, we might come back sometime in January. Uh, we hope. Thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, today. Let us know what you think of the show. Uh, let us, I suppose uh, it's been a, absolutely an honour to be able to share the screen with the one and only physio legend <laughs> BC here. Uh, if you haven't already liked uh, this page uh, Facebook uh, on Facebook uh, Foot Mobilisation Techniques, please hit uh, the like button. Uh, also, if you have a colleague who you think would benefit from uh, getting some more distilled, up-to-date, evidence-informed uh, advice on looking after knees and arthritis uh, patients, share this link with them. Uh, on behalf of the whole FMT family, I'll say a big thank you to BC and also a big thank you to Dr. Lil, who is uh, lurking. Lil and Penny. Lurking. Penny, Penny, she just she, she yeah, slept the way. Left me alone this week. <laughs> and those, those wounds heal up from <laughs> the last week. <laughs> yes. Remember, you're only one click away from helping more knees like never before. Click on the freebie, uh, get your freebie, which has got lots of good stuff, as long as the freebie link works. If it isn't, it'll be, won't be too far away. That's it for today. Cheers. Thanks, man.